Well, good morning. We're going to do a little bit of something different today in, in the message, and it has to do with, um, related to, you know, this week is going to be Valentine's Day. Men, did you hear me? Just a not-so-subtle reminder. This week is Valentine's Day. Okay. All right, I'd like for you to look with me to Romans chapter 7. And when you get that, just to hold that spot, Romans chapter 7. And then look just over a few pages, several pages, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11. So Romans 7 and 2 Corinthians 11. And I'll seek to explain to you here how I'm going to do so. I'm actually not going to do an exposition of, of that. I'll show you how I'm going to use what uh, Paul has done there twice and uh, relate it uh, in ways that I think will help us be able to relate to God better. <clears throat> there was a little four or five year old child who was asleep in his bed until uh, a storm came up and the lightning started flashing and the thunder started clapping and he woke up and he was scared and he started crying out for his mama and daddy. <clears throat> and finally his daddy came in the room and again he was scared to death. His father laid down beside him. He said, son, we've told you over and over, you don't have anything to be afraid of because God is with you. And he said, Daddy, I know God's with me, but I'd like to have somebody that's got skin. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I can understand that. And God understood that. We wanted somebody that had skin. So you know what he did? He took on skin. Uh, many passages talk about this. Hebrews cha uh, chapter 1, the very opening verses of Hebrews. Long ago, in many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets and folks that was a great way that god spoke by the prophets in the old testament but listen what it says in these last days he has spoken to us by his son you see he took on flesh for a lot of reasons but folks one of the reasons is like that same problem that little kid had we want somebody that we can see and relate to folks in a lot of ways it's hard to relate to god because we don't see him. We don't see him. You know, how do you relate to somebody that you do not see? So God condescended to us. He came and met us where we are, and he sent Jesus. And, and, and Jesus actually further followed this same pattern of saying, let me take something that's hard for you to understand, like God, and I'll enflesh it for you, and you can relate to it better. But even in Jesus' ministry, he did the same thing. He would, he would relate to people where they were to where they could understand it. Come down to where they were. I think of the discussion he had with Nicodemus. You know, Nicodemus, they were talking about being born again. And Jesus started talking about you need to be born of the Spirit. And he said, well, I don't know a whole lot about the Spirit. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, as Jesus was trying to explain about the Spirit, he said, well... Folks, a good way of teaching is start with something somebody knows and make a connection to what they don't know. And so Jesus said, okay, that's okay. He said, then let's talk about the wind. You know anything about the wind? Well, yeah. And he said, well, where's the wind come from? He said, well, I don't know. He said, well, where's the place it's going to go next? He said, well, I don't know. Well, come to think of it, he didn't know near as much about the wind as he thought he did. Okay. <clears throat> but Jesus said that's actually the point. The Spirit is that way. The, the Spirit blows where it wills. You don't know where it's come. So it's not there so much for you to understand, but for you to experience the way we actually sang about uh, at the beginning of our service. Uh, and so for us to understand how we're to relate to God, God helps us understand that by the Scriptures. A, a, and a great example of this is the entire book of Hosea. In the book of Hosea, God likens his relationship with Israel to a marriage. Now, we all understand marriage. Now, m m I would say most of us here are married. We have been married. Some of us have not, but even all of us understand marriage. We understand how that functions, okay? And so 
God helped us through the book of Hosea to understand our relationship with God in ways by understanding marriage. Well, I want to suggest to you we can do the same thing looking at the passages that we have before us. So what I'm wanting us to do today and see the sort of a springboard that Paul uses this is he likens our relationship with God to being married. You say, well, I, I think I may can understand being married. I can actually see that. Then that with somebody that I don't. Well, then let's try to understand God more by understanding how he has taught us things through marriage. So twice Paul get, works an analogy here of us being married to Christ. In Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 4, now notice it here, He's, he's been talking about husband and wife in verses 1 through 3. But then he says in verse 4, Therefore, brethren, you are also made to die to the law through the body of Christ, notice, so that you could be joined to another. Now that joined to another, he's talking about in marriage, that you can in some uh, analogous way be married to Christ. There are parallels in marriage to our marriage to Christ. And then when you look at 2 Corinthians 11, 2, he actually makes this point again. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that Christ um, might be present, uh, um, that I might present you as a pure virgin who to Christ. So there are analogies between Marriage, if we can understand marriage, it'll help us understand how we're to relate to God. Because I said, God, we don't see him. How do you relate to somebody that you don't see? I'm going to tell you, in many ways, the same way we relate to somebody that we do see. So in, in making uh, this application, okay, I want you to first see that in both situations, in, in our marriages, and in our, as it were, marriage to Christ, relationship to him, it begins with committing oneself. Committing one's self. We commit ourselves in marriage. We commit ourselves in our relationship with Christ. And then secondly, from that commitment, look, a relationship grows. Just like in marriage, the same thing is true in our relationship with Christ. And then not only that, folks, for that relationship to grow, relationships have to be cultivated. Just like in a marriage relationship, the same thing is true in our relationship with God. It begins with a commitment. Now, I met the woman who is to be my wife and is now my wife. I, I met her on the campus of the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary in 1977. After we got to know each other uh, pretty well, uh, we started doing things together. Uh, sometimes we would take a leisurely stroll around the seminary campus. Uh, sometimes we went out and, and ate. Uh, we actually took a couple of courses together. Uh, we went to church together. We did a lot of things together. And uh, we grew somewhat in our relationship, various things that, uh, that we did. And then one day, I asked her to marry me. And feeling sorry for me, <laughs> she agreed to do so. <clears throat> okay? So I had bought a ring, and I asked her, and uh, now, what is our situation? Uh, well, I want to point out to you, we were not married yet. Okay? You say, well, how many times do you have to walk around the seminary campus before you're married? Uh, how many times do you have to study together or go church together? How many times do you have to do that before you're married? And, of course, you know as well as I know, if she would have put up with it, we could have done that until today, and we would not have been married because you don't get married that way. I think we know how, actually, people get married. There was a day, and it was April the 5th, 1980, that she and I made a commitment before a congregation similar to this with standing before one another, her family and friends, and before God, we made a commitment to one another. 
And that commitment involved that I would keep myself unto her and she would keep herself unto me as long as we both shall live. It happened at a specific place at a specific time when we made a commitment to one another. Now, how does that relate to being saved? Uh, folks, how long do people have to go to church before they're saved? How many times do they have to give money to the church? How many times do they have to do good things for their neighbors that they think would please God and on and on before they're saved? Folks, they can go on doing that the rest of their life and not be saved because a person is not saved that way. A person is saved at a specific point in time just like they're married at a specific point in time. And there are parallels because both of those involve a covenant relationship. A person can go to church for a long time, be involved in Christian work for a long time, be out doing good things for a long time, but that is not going to bring them into a saving relationship with Christ. That happens at a specific point, at a specific time, when we come to Christ in faith and we make a commitment of ourselves to him in such a way that he commits himself to us and he becomes our Lord, he becomes our master, and then we are saved, we are in that kind of relationship. Folks, it's not enough for me have to decided that I was going to get married. Okay? There's, uh, it's not enough for a person to decide, well, I think I'm going to be saved. What we, ha what we need to do is follow the pattern of that prodigal son. Remember that wonderful story? He, he's separated from his father. He realizes it. He remembers the glory of his father's house, and he makes a statement. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say uh, to him, okay, I will arise, I'll, I will say unto him, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And folks, here's what the very next verse says. And he went. And he went. You see, there's a lot of people that have said that's what I'm going to do, and that's not what they've done. There's a lot of people that can say they're going to get married, but they're not getting married until a commitment is made. A person is not saved until they come to faith in Christ and they commit themselves to Him. They repent of their sins at a specific time, in a specific location, and then they are saved. Now, folks, let me say something about this when I say I committed myself to my wife. You know, when I committed myself to my wife, I committed myself completely and wholeheartedly, not, not halfway. Uh, I did not commit myself to her in such a way that um, I would say, okay, uh, I'll, be, I'll commit myself to you five days a week. Hey, that's a pretty good deal. There's seven days, five out of seven, that's not bad. I want to tell you, and you know, that would not have been good enough. That is not the kind of commitment that, a, that, a, that uh, uh, has a marriage and makes that marriage a valid marital relationship. It is a complete surrender, a complete giving of oneself in that covenant. Folks, when we come to a relationship with Christ, it is a full commitment relationship. It is not part-time. It is not as many people seem to think, well, it's a Sunday thing, you know. I sort of give my, my, my life to Christ on Sunday, but I sort of do what I do, want to do the rest of the week. That's not what a commitment to Christ is. A commitment to Christ is complete surrender at all times. We do not compartmentalize our lives and say, well, you know, Sunday's my worship day and I do these things. These other days I do just whatever I want to. Well, folks, everything that we are doing is supposed to be done under the Lordship of Christ. We are not to compartmentalize our lives and carve some area out of it and say, well, he is not actually Lord over that part. That is, does not have anything to do with my commitment to him. That, that is a part that I reserve for myself. Okay? You don't do that in a marriage relationship, and we do not do that with 
Christ. It is a full commitment. It's not just what we do while we're here. Several, well, a couple of centuries ago, uh, a, a man was traveling in New England, basically colonial times, and he was going to his church, and he found out he wasn't going to be there on time, and he saw he was passing a Quaker church. And he said, well, I'll just stop in and worship with them. And so when he went in, the chairs were in a circle, and everybody was sitting there with their head bowed. And so he sat down with his head bowed. And he sat, and he waited, and he waited, and he kept looking, and everybody was sitting there. He didn't realize that's how they worship. And so finally, after about 15 minutes, he tapped the person next to him, and he said, when does the service start? And he said, the service starts when this meeting's over. Folks, you want to know when our service starts? It's when this meeting's over. Our service is to the Lord Jesus at all times. We don't say, well, I'll give him this time when we have a worship service. No, our service to him is 24 hours a day completely. It is a full commitment. We cannot compartmentalize our lives and say, well, this part is my religious life and this part is everything else. Folks, our commitment to Christ is to permeate everything that we do. It is a full commitment as a marriage is. So do you realize that during World War II, when six million Jews were killed. Many of them were killed in concentration camps and they were brought in and gassed. Okay? Now, is it, does it come as a surprise to you that many of the people that were putting these Jews to death in the gas chambers on Saturday night were worshiping in their German Lutheran church the next morning? You say, well, how could they do that? Well, it's just a more radical form of what we oftentimes do. They compartmentalized their lives. They didn't see how what they did on Saturday had anything to do with what they were doing on Sunday. They had compartmentalized their lives. Now, we may not do that in such a radical form as that, I trust. But the question is, do we have a lot of times that same attitude? Sunday is indeed the Lord's day, and that means the rest of them are sort of mine. That is not the kind of commitment that I was able to make. When I was married, I was married. And I want you to notice, I don't try to be married. Okay? I don't try to be married. I asked a man one time, I said, are you a Christian? He said, well, I try to be. I said, let me ask you a question. Are you married, or do you just try to be? He thought, well, that's odd. And I had to try to draw the parallel for him. <laughs> Folks, you don't try to be a Christian. You try to live a godly life in Christ after he has saved us. But one of the most difficult things I have found in years of ministry is getting it through the minds of Christian people <laughs> that you don't try to be a Christian. <laughs> you either are or you're not. There was that time in which you commit yourself fully to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord with a full commitment, or you haven't done that, okay? A person is married or they are not. They are saved and a Christian and a child of God in a relationship with Christ, or they are not. And it depends on that moment that we talked about when a person comes before Christ and surrenders to his lordship. They enter into a covenant with Jesus, okay? And then we are his, and we find great delight in making that kind of surrender. But folks, that's not the end of it. That's the problem with a lot of people, is they, they, they get married, and they think, well, that was the end of it. Yeah? No, folks, getting married, how long does it take to get married? It's going to take about 15 minutes, maybe, you know? You get married? Well, folks, a marriage lasts the rest of your life. You know, the, the people confuse the wedding with the marriage. I, I have to talk to a couple. I don't do really weddings anymore, but when I did, I would try to exc explain to them. I'd say, now look, how many hours have y'all spent planning your wedding? Oh, man, like a hundred. That's, well, that's wonderful. 
How many hours have you spent planning your marriage? You with me? Uh, your marriage is something that goes on and on and on. It doesn't stop at the time that a wedding takes place. You know, I, um, I, I think we have to look at a, uh, our, our church churches that way. The same thing in our relationships. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad if somebody were to ask me, and I guess that before, in what ways are the church, is the church in a whole, in a whole better off than we were, say, what I remember 30 years ago? Of course, in a lot of ways, it's not. But I think there's some ways that it is. And I think churches in the last 30 years, on the whole, and your church is one of them, does a very good job at seeking to grow people in the faith after they've made that initial commitment. You see, some people get married and then they don't do anything with their marriage. A lot of times, a lot of churches, I'm afraid, have given people the impression, well, you just sort of come to Jesus and then you go to heaven someday. You know, well, the Bible actually says there's an awful lot that's supposed to take place in there, in that great commission. It doesn't tell us just to win people to Jesus. It says teaching them to observe all things. You know what we call that? We call that discipleship. That once a person commits themselves in faith to Christ, there's now a relationship is supposed to begin. When I got married, my relationship with my wife now wasn't over. It was just beginning. It was then to have a, a, a period of growth. And that's what we have been trying to do for these last how many ever years? You can figure it out. You can do the math. But you know, the problem is, a lot of times we take the wrong approach. And I don't think Christians mean to do this. Again, I think it's in part because it, how do you relate to somebody that you can't see? And that's why I keep coming back and saying, well, there's an analogy of it in marriage. Look how we do it in marriage and make the parallel, and you actually do it in somewhat the same way. But, you know, some people just, you know, they, they, their heart's in the right place, and, and they've heard certain things they're supposed to do. Now, as I said, Valentine's Day is this, is this way. What, what if I talked to some of you guys and said, look, now I really want to be a good husband. Uh, what do y'all think good husbands do, you know? You just tell them, I just list two or three things, and, and one of you says, oh, and buy flowers for Valentine's Day. Oh, good, yeah, let me write that down. That's the best one. And so, for Valentine's Day, I bring my wife some flowers. And she says, why'd you do that? And I said, well, I talked to this guy at church, and he said that's the kind of thing that husbands are supposed to do, and I wanted to be a good husband, and so I did it. You say, oh, thanks. You know, where's, folks, where's the love? Where's the relationship? You know, see, a lot of people, they get saved and they want to do what's right. And, and for instance, they'll get the Bible and say, well, I want to start doing things like Christians do. And, and that's a wonderful thing. But folks, if we just say, well, I'm just going to do these things because the Bible says these are kinds of things Christians are supposed to do. I said, Wait a minute, but do you not realize that you can actually do those things and not do them out of a love for God? that we have to understand the things that we're doing, we're offering as, as sacrifices unto, unto God. And see, there are problems that result if we don't see and understand that, Lord, we are relating to you as person. You're a personal God. God's not some kind of an abstract principle or an abstract, God plans, he wills, he loves, he is grieved. He longs for relationship with them. We go, it's personal. And, and we, if we're not careful, we can just go through all these motions of being a good husband or being a good wife or being a good Christian and asking, but wait a minute. Is my heart of love actually in this? Am I doing all these things as a believer that I'm doing and still missing the two great commandments, the particular first one, love the Lord your God with all of your heart your soul, your strength, with everything. And if we're not careful, we're dealing with God as some kind of an abstract principle. My wife is not an abstract principle. She's a person that I relate to. She's a person that I love. She's a person that I try to please, that I have absolutely committed myself to. And if we don't see that person aspect of it, there are problems that arise. 
I mean, your, your relationships, again, can be very stilted. I just do these things and do these things. The Bible says do these things, so I do them, and that's great. But folks, we're supposed to do what we do out of a love for God and a relationship for him of, that we have, that we've entered into a relationship with him. And we certainly do these things, but we realize that we're doing them to and for a personal God because we are relating to him personally. And we lose that if we are not careful. And, and another thing that you're likely to do, folks, if we that you come back again and, and look at our marriage. Look how marriages are supposed to work. See, if, if it's just a stilted relationship and I'm just doing it to get by, well, what we end up doing is as little as we can to get by. Um, again, how terrible would it be if I went to my wife and said, okay, <laughs> Uh, I need you to make a list for me. For me to be a good husband, give me the bottom line of what it is I have to do because that's what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for the bottom line. What, what's the least I can actually do to be a good husband and then I'm going to be satisfied? And she'd probably say, uh, forget it. And that's what she ought to say. Uh, but folks, if we are not careful, and, and, and there are Christians, and you know it, and there may be facets of places of our lives where we do the same thing, and we have to be careful, where we are really asking ourselves, how little can I do and still God be happy with me? But you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't get it right all the time, but my attitude toward my wife is usually this, not how little can I do for you, but how much can I do for you? Because I actually find joy in doing things that please you. And I'm not interested in finding out how little I can do and get by. I'm trying to find out how much I can do because I'm not relating to some abstract principle. I'm relating to a person to whom I have committed myself and whom, to whom I actually love and I'm trying to do as much as I possibly can. Folks, if we're constantly asking ourselves, how little can I do? Lord, how close can I get to the edge over here? How close can I get to the edge of something and still please you? Folks, that's the wrong question to ask. The right question is, Lord, how far can I stay from that in order to please you? That's what I'm wanting. If we don't do that, we seek to do as little as possible. And then say we lose the joy because the privileges that we have, we start to see them as duties that we have some kind of duty to God. You know, I'd rather us never think in terms of our duties to God. I'd rather us think in terms of the privileges that we have to do the things that we do. That I don't do it because I have to. You know, God's law says do this, and I say, Lord, I know, because that's exactly what I want to do. And it says don't do this over here. And I say, Lord, my heart, that's exactly what I don't want to do. I don't look at what you have called me to do as a duty. I see it as a privilege. It is a privilege for me to do the things for my wife that I do. It's, I don't see it as a duty. And if we're not careful, that's what happens, and we lose the love. I remember hearing a, um, a, 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 a he was actually a camp director, that uh, told of uh, how he actually had, his wife had, had um, how he had met his wife and gotten married. He was from the upstate, and she was from the lower part of the state. And he said she was up here visiting some friends, and his friend said, well, you know, sort of set him up with a blind date. You know, we're having this party. Why don't you go pick her up? And he thought, well, she can get another ride. She doesn't need me to pick her up. What do they need me to pick her up for? Well, it was a duty. Well, he did it. Well, let me tell you something. The next week, he was driving to Charleston to see her. And he didn't see it as being a duty. It was a privilege. And it was a joy. You know why? Because he loved her. That makes all the difference in the world. He really loved her. It was a relationship. You know, there's a beautiful passage tucked away back in Genesis chapter 29. You remember the story of, of um, Jacob? And uh, he's wanting to get married, and so he makes a deal with Laban, who's going to be his father-in-law. He's going to get the daughter in marriage, and remember, he works for seven years, and he gets her, and then they have the marriage, and up the veil comes, and he looks, and 
hey, that's not the one that I thought I was going to get. He said, that's, that's okay, no problem. Uh, you can have the other one. Just work seven more years and you can have it. And that text says this, and he served seven more years to get Rachel. Listen to this. And it seemed like to him as only a few days because he loved her. Don't you see that? <laughs> because he loved her. Uh, it was a joy to do it. I, I remember visiting one of my parishioners years ago who had uh, lost his wife. i uh, been married a long time. This, he was way up in his 80s and she was not far behind. And when I went to see him, you know, a few days after the funeral, I was talking to him and he said, preacher, you know, we never did have much money. I uh, said, we were able, I was able to save a little bit. And, uh, but he said, you know, when my wife had to go in the nursing home, he said, it took every penny that I had. And then he said, you know, I can't think of a way that I would have rather spent my money than to have spent it on her. Folks, that wasn't a duty. He, that was his love. That's what he desired doing. He, he wasn't doing this for some kind of an abstract principle. He was doing it for a person that he loved and he was in a relationship with. We are called to serve a God who we are committed to and we are in a relationship with. We want to do as much as we possibly can because we love him and we love him because he first loved us. But folks, after that, this relationship, folks, they don't happen by accident. I thought maybe I'd get some amens from the couples on that. Growing together doesn't happen by accident. It takes effort, it takes work, and it is enjoyable, and it is worth it. We have to see them as being real. We communicate with them. Folks, do you communicate with your spouse in some way the same way you communicate with God? Yeah, do you ever go to your, your spouse and say, thank you for this, thank you for that, I appreciate this, you are good to me? On a, like, yeah. Folks, you know what? We ought to just talk to God the way we talk with our spouse. You know? Uh, I, I, had a, I had a friend, I, I, he just championed that. I, I just, it, it would be almost hard for me not to laugh when he was leading us in prayer. And he said, let me pray for us. And he'd just start talking like God, but he said, God, bless your heart. Man, you just are good to me. You've done this. And I'm saying, who's he talking to? You know? He was just talking to God. He just pouring his heart out to somebody he was in a relationship with. And boy, that's the way he grew in grace. For is that the way we, uh, we pray? And, and folks, God communicates to us, obviously, by, by his word. You know, um, I, I like to listen. But before my wife and I w were married, back after we were engaged, she was still, she was actually working at a, a Ridgecrest camp up in North Carolina. I was still in, in Greenville. And, and, um, but uh, she would send me a letter two or three days a week, you know. And, and when I would come in from work, my mother would say, well, now you got another letter from Deanna. I'd say, well, just throw it over there. I'll get it in a few minutes. You think so? <laughs> I hope you think better of me than that. You know, I couldn't get to it quick enough. And I, I read a couple of lines of it, and said, well, I'll get the rest of it later. No, I just couldn't get enough of it. Just read it over and over and over again because... It helped me know her better and understand who she is and what made her tick. And those are the kinds of things I wanted to know because I loved her. You see, when we, when we read the scriptures, it teaches us more and more about God. And the more and more we know about God, then the more we want to talk to him and learn more about him. And then the more, and you see, it starts this cycle, just like in a, the more you know your spouse and love them, the more you communicate and grow, and it just grows more. And that's what our relationship with God is. It is like marriage. It begins at a point in time when a commitment is made. And from that commitment, a relationship grows. We call it a life of sanctification. 
And it grows when we make the commitment that is necessary to grow to know the one that we love more and more. And God's just encouraging us along, saying, come on up higher. Come on up higher. Let's walk more closely. Folks, that's what the Christian life actually is. Marriage is like that relationship, and that relationship is like marriage. And in order to teach us, God showed us how relating to him was in many ways how we relate to each other in a marriage. So if it's easier for you to understand that with somebody you can see, then understand that relationship real well and then project that onto our relationship with God and say, that's what he expects from me. Now, you know, it all begins with a relationship at a moment in time. That means if you're a person here who has not come to that place, you've come to church many times, you've done that, but you've never come to the place where you saw the beauty of Christ, that you saw in him your only hope, you saw him in the great beauty that he actually is, and you've desired him. And you want to come to him. Folks, he, he says you can come, and he says he won't cast you out, but you have to come one way. You have to come with faith in him, commitment to him, repentance of sin, and trusting that what he did for you on the cross, he will apply to your heart. And he will bring forgiveness to your soul and begin a relationship with you. But you know what's interesting? You have to do that on your own. I can't do that for you. I can't even help you do that. You know, I can point you in that direction, but you have to do that. But here's the beautiful thing. After you get that relationship started, you're not on your own. You see, we, we, we have to be saved individually. But we grow in that relationship with Christ corporately. We do that with each other. And that is the importance of a church family. And this is a good group of people to do that with. There may be people here today that would say, you know, I, I, I need the Lord Jesus. Well, listen, you call out on him right there where you are, and he will save you. He, he's, he, you know, somebody, he's not down here. He's, he's closer than that. He's closer than your fingertips. You just call on him. You see, if you need somebody for further instruction, our pastoral staff's here. If you say, you know, I, I may have been coming to this church a while, and I think this is where the Lord wants me to serve. I want, I want to grow in that relationship with him, with this group of people right here. Well, you won't find a better group. And I would just encourage you to come and share that with the pastoral staff here. We accept members in various ways, and they can explain that to you. Okay? But what we all do need to do is make sure we have made that commitment that we understand that's only the beginning and that we're willing to do whatever else it takes for the one that we love to please him and glorify him in all things let's stand father we thank you for loving us lord we cannot imagine how we could have ever loved you had you not loved us first lord thank you for becoming real to us in the person of Christ, for taking on skin. Lord, we could hear your words. We can read them. Lord, we can learn from them. And now, Lord, we can enter, because of him, into a relationship with you. And Lord, it's a relationship of beauty that we can grow in our love for you and our commitment. Lord, that we can have the hope of having a relationship with you throughout all eternity. And Lord, we are grateful for that. Lord, help us to take our relationship with you very seriously. Lord, if there's any area of our life that we're compartmentalizing, that we're, we're saying, Lord, everything's yours except this. Lord, don't let us walk away from you with that attitude. Lord, help us to truly say, I surrender all. All to Jesus. I surrender, Lord, and find the beauty of that relationship that you plan for us to have with you. In the name of Christ, we pray.